शुरू करो हाँ सर डियर पार्टिसिपेंट्स एंड रिस्पेक्टेड फैकल्टीज वेलकम यू ऑल टू डेज आई पी डी आई वर्चुअल क्लास टू डेज वी आर वेरी मच डिलाइटेड ऑन आर प्रोफेसर एम एन नजर सर अवार टीचर्स ऑफ द टीचर्स विथ अस अगेन इज बिलियन लेक्चर ऑन सेवन डेज बैक ऑन हार्ट फेल विथ प्रिजर्व इजेक्शन फंक्शन टू डे इज हार्ट फेल विद रिड्यूस इजेक्शन फंक्शन सो सर Uh, before you start professor abdul sir please few comments on the lecture last week uh, we have a beautiful lecture the heart failure with preserve ejection fraction today we are going to hear about heart failure with reduce ejection fraction and as always we are expecting that sir will deliver us a beautiful lecture with that much ado i am requesting uh, prasanna dil sir to start his lecture and welcome everybody thank you sir welcome you sir assalamu alaikum uh, uh with a uh, uh, praying from my deepest heart for those who are still affected with corona virus in our profession and also uh, throughout the country and especially i am very much shocked uh, uh, knowing professor abdul hussain khan choudhury uh, who is in uh, icu of square hospital uh with home actually i worked since 1978 uh, 79 till long ago a uh, long time so i pray for everybody to be uh, safe and those who are not yet affected please stay safe uh <clears throat> uh <clears throat> actually in the last week i have uh, told about the hyper, uh, heart failure with uh, preserve ejection fraction and uh, today i am going to have uh, a, a presentation or a class uh, for the uh, md resident of uh, cardiology resident uh, fellows in training and those who doctors are uh, in a course of diploma in cardiology so as you know the heart failure is a very big subject and uh, uh, sub it is very difficult to cover in a very short time but anyway i will try to uh cover it as far as i possible in a simpler manner uh heart failure <coughs> uh, uh, <coughs> can be divided in many form so next uh, the first the, the main uh, educational objectives or learning objectives of this presentation is firstly i will define something about definition and pathophysiology of heart failure oh, so sir may manner. i have your attention please yeah sir please uh, share your screen sir oh or oh, fine okay 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 is it okay now yes sir it is okay, okay now sir. sir make it full screen sir it's okay Oh, I'll make it. Okay. Nice, sir. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. you can continue, okay. sir. Thank you. you can continue. Yes. Thank you. So uh, now, uh, my uh, my my put today's uh, presentation will have some of the educational uh, objectives. Are uh, first, I will define something about uh, definition of the physiology of heart failure. and then i'll try to have a simpler classification and which is very important for descriptive categorization of atp some clinical manifestation and how to diagnose it and main part is for management of patient with heart failure and i will uh, describe in detail with the pharmacological therapy and comorbidities 
And just to complete the uh, topics, I will touch upon on the device based therapy to some extent and such, some of the surgical options. And very important nowadays, you know, which is still not developed in our country, we should to, to, uh, say something about palliative and end stage uh, life care in patients with heart failure. Uh, <clears throat> So, as you know from the from our beginning and all for the course, that heart failure basically is a very big subject because it afflicts millions of people worldwide, and it has got diverse causes and risk factors. And there are large numbers of mega trials and, and literature. Uh, actually, it is a one person for a one person. It is very difficult to recapitulate everything, and definitely it has got a high mortality and though we have got uh, several drugs and devices and many a times during the course of last three decades the paradigm uh, has shifted from understanding and our treatment about high blood pressure definitely it's in a costly one because it needs a prolonged hospitalization sometimes this is fat fatal and more of uh, above all these we have got also the com it is complicated by many comorbidities and really management aspect this is a true uh, Actually, true multidisciplinary uh, management should be uh, there. Uh, as you know, that uh, this particular disease has got repeated hospitalization. If in the first time in the hospitalization, most of the patients, got approximately 10% uh, patient die in the hospital. And on this discharge, within 30 days, approximately 10 to 16% dies. And in, in, within one year, 20 to 30%. And 40 to 40% died in five years. So we can see that 50% patient will die after the five years of diagnosis. And of these, 50% uh, die uh, in suddenly. So sudden cardiac death is a very, very important aspect of this particular disease. Definition is very simple. Just to recapitulate, uh, this definition has been given by the various uh, uh, guidelines authorities, uh, societies of the world. So this is a very simple one. So main definition is this is basically, basically is a complex clinical syndrome and which has got uh, some structural and functional impairment in the heart. Uh, and the basic physiology is either the ventricular filling is restricted or the ejection flux energy reduced. And for this reason, there will be some symptoms and signs mainly, mainly uh, by dyspnea and fatigue due to some limited exercise deficit and, and therefore the uh, fluid retention that may be in the systemic circulation or in the peripheral circulation. So the newer diagnosis which has been a bit enlarged from the VFR one by the ESA guidelines. I prefer these guidelines to be remembered because this is very easy to understand the basic which pathophysiology of this. So they had actually defined heart failure as a clinical syndrome characterized by the typical symptoms like breathless and other things and by some signs like a, a distended jugular vein, pulmonary clotus and peripheral edema. And this is due to structural and functional cardiac abnormalities. And they results actually reduce cardiac output and elevated intracardiac pressure and give many system, especially during, during a stress or even rest in the, at the advanced level. So if you remember this definition from top to bottom, possibly you understand at least the basic pathophysiology of uh, heart failure. So going to the pathophysiology of heart failure, uh, uh, heart failure, say the pathophysiology basically is heterogeneous clinical syndrome and we don't have, this particular disease not has a single phenotype. There are several phenotypes. So pathology basically is really complex and our understanding is still emerging. Uh, one thing we must remember that we should not consider heart failure is the only heart disease, but with the rest of the body uh, needs to better understood in case of heart failure, because uh, totally body will respond either through its, uh, its a mechanical format or, or its uh, uh, neurohemoral formats, the body will respond to it. So heart failure, is not only the disease of the heart. In fact, it is a disease of the whole body because it responds in a different way in different time. Uh, causes of heart failure, everybody often know, but there are important causes and there are less important causes. But commonly is ischemic heart disease, hypertension, diabetes. Actually, diabetes can cause high, uh, high, uh, heart failure through so either ischemic heart disease or they can have some sort of direct cardiotoxicity. 
and there are other drugs like valvular disease cardiomyopathy congenital heart, heart disease especially volume overload some arrhythmias mainly tachyarrhythmias and the high output failures are there some anemia hyperthyroid and sometimes ab fistula different causes pericardial disease is important but uh, less uh, common and another is a, a sort of thing is right ventricular uh, actually right heart failure we call it and this is usually usually done by either primary or secondary pulmonary hypertension especially for pulmonary and frequently common in our country so now if we summarize this pathophysiology from a risk to the heart failure we can see in the, uh, the left side uh, there are various causes uh, of of uh, causes that we call them risk factors starting for coronary artery disease hypertension diabetes etc initially in the start of the pathophysiological study they cause some sort of myocardial injury and this myocardial injury gives rise to pathological myocardial and this is enhanced by the neurohemorrhage activation and by some risk factor there is something myocardial toxicity and this leads to low ejection fraction and the symptoms develop and ultimately they develop either pump failure go to chronic stage may suddenly die or they may develop at the man suddenly death so this is a sort of thing and this will progress uh, as the disease progresses and uh, we have seen in the earlier slides that uh, this has been the heart failure has been progressed by the cardiac dysfunction triggers uh, the activation of the three compensatory neurological system and for from there the gradually the cardiovascular function is deteriorates uh, we see that uh, once the cardiac structure injury is there there is activation of the compensatory uh, of the compensatory mechanism of the body the first is a uh, sympathetic nervous system the second one is a rest system and both the system actually activated in response to reduce cardiac output and they have got short term effects for beneficial in early heart failure but in the long term activation exerts the activation the unfavorable effects of that and the patient will go into heart failure on the other hand there is a bench system for net net uh, and natriuretic peptide system they release natriuretic peptides in the sort of cardiac stress and they actually opposes the actions of uh, of uh, sympathetic nervous system and rest so that is how the body balances its cardiac function and uh, protect it now uh with this background let us uh, let us uh, have a new conception because we already or we already die die we usually diagnose heart failure in an advanced stage when the symptoms are but actually the disease starts from very asymptomatic stage so what do you see that they in the prior to the development of symptom there is a critical asymptomatic phase which may be associated with poor outcomes what do Oh, by this what do you what do you mean this means that if we protect the, the heart in the earlier critical asymptomatic phase possibly we can lessen the heart symptoms or we can prolong the life so considering this the acch heart failure has broadened the con uh, conception and divided uh, their phases from starting to the end uh, they described phase 1 this is uh, the patients are at high risk uh, they have got certain factors but they do not failure once they go down uh, down here they develop some structural heart disease uh, like say pvsm and etc but still then uh, they are they don't have any symptoms once they more progresses their structure will uh, uh, will uh, structural heart disease will be there with certain symptom this symptom may be the patient have currently had or have been in the pop, uh, in the future for example uh, some uh, structural heart disease and with shortness of breath and etc and in the final stage the stage is that this is actually the severe uh, heart failure or advanced heart failure we call it refractory and in this patient mainly the patient should get symptomatic even at rest so if we consider these four stages four stages the first two stages basically is not heart failure this is at risk for heart failure but this is very important for management prevention and sometimes to treatment and the second two stages is c and stage d is the difference in the uh, treatment schedule uh, they usually try to cover the uh, second uh, stage c and stage d and you know everybody will know the we are also functionally classify the patient for different aspect for, for uh, communication 
for treatment facilities and everything we can accommodate in uh, classification of functional classification. There are few more functional classification, but NHA classification has been used for a pretty long time. And this has been used in many uh, clinical trials. So this is important, everybody was know. So my uh, presentation in this is, you can see on the right side, the mortality. As the classes increase, the mortality rate, increase, one year mortality increased. Uh, starting from class one, it is about five to 10%. But when it goes to uh, class four, the mortality become uh, approximately 60%. And now if we just uh, amalgamate all this aspect in this picture, we see that uh, this in the middle uh, pyramid is the ABCD stages of the ACCH statement. And here is the description as already mentioned. And on the left side, you can see the NOHA classification starting from uh, one, class one to class four. And you can see the class A and B actually has no symptom and uh, a symptom starts from C and you can see this uh, approximate uh, distribution of NHA classes. And another important on the right hand side you see there is important study for called the uh, Almaser County Epidemiological study on the right side you can see they studied uh, patients with uh, 45 years or old and they found this uh, distribution of, the, of, of their finding. Actually, they found normal, uh, about 32% for normal, uh, and 22% was in stage A. And, and basically, heart failure occurs in 12%, approximately 12% uh, in, the, in the population. So this uh, gives us an idea of the gradual development of heart failure and their severity in different stages. Now, uh, with this background, how we actually uh, describe, we must describe this heterogeneous group of heart of the disease with a different uh, risk factor, different uh, pathological situation. So once we diagnose this thing, so there are several constructs have been created for the purpose of describing and classifying. But sometimes the, their definition overlap and sometimes with a coexistence with other groups. So usually we uh, classify as acute versus chronic. Recently and very last two decades, so we have uh, used heart failure with reduced ejection fraction versus heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction. And sometimes we must, uh, for clinical use, we can use left versus right, left versus right ventricular failure. But remember that this classification is not very distinct. One sometimes uh, overlaps with the other. But for clinical reason, for treatment reason, for communication with the uh, colleagues reason, uh, we have to uh, describe this one. So in the next few slides, I will want to see what about uh, heart failure with ejection, reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with ejection, uh, ejection fraction. Initially, uh, this uh, was diagnosed as systolic dysfunction and diastolic heart failure. But heart failure with the reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction were previously so as systolic and diastolic. But it is now well established that abnormalities of systolic function are present in heart failure patient even within the range of normal red ventricular ejection fraction. Similarly, uh, the patient with red ventricular uh, heart failure with uh, reduced ejection fraction and diastolic dysfunction. So this is not synonymous, but may, may be, may, maybe it is very closer. So many a times we use uh, interchangeably. Uh, distinction between heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction is very important because therapies that have proven mortality benefit in patients with reduced ejection fraction do not appear to be effective in heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction. And in some extent, these conditions may have fundamentally different pathophysiologic mechanisms and phenotypes. So this is very important nowadays because uh, many of the drugs uh, they are in favorable for the reduce and uh, uh, reduce ejection fraction heart failure, and some may not work in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, uh, so now, see the difference between the rejection fraction, reduced ejection fraction heart failure, and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. This is a phenotypic, and you see on the left side, there are certain okay, parameters you can see left ventricular ejection fraction, ischemic heart disease prevalence, hypertension prevalence, atrial fibrillation, et cetera, and with mitral regurgitation. Now, 
If you compare the reduced ejection fraction failure with uh, on the right side uh, preserved ejection fraction, you can see the differences. For example, ischemic heart is very common in reduced ejection fraction. Hypertension is very common. Atrial fibrillation is very common in uh, uh, heart failure with preserved ejection. So, so there definitely this phenotyping is important for management uh, management issue. So, heart failure and phenotype is strongly linked to the etiology of heart failure and is a key determinant for heart failure management. Now, even then, uh, those three things we usually usually uh, use, but there are certain clinical terminology used. That's, uh, that's I'll give you this definition. So first is sometimes a, a symptomatic left ventricular dysfunction, because this patient has never exhibited any typical signs, but uh, by some other means, we are diagnosed that this patient has got left ventricular systolic dysfunction or diastolic dysfunction, but no signs or symptoms of heart failure. Acute heart failure is an emergency situation because this patient was never was completely uh, asymptomatic before, but suddenly they develop heart failure. Chronic heart failure is long-standing syndrome in which patient exhibits symptoms for a long period of time, usually either deteriorating or maybe uh, stable for a pretty long time. And another important term, which is very important nowadays, is acute decompensated heart failure. This is an heart failure. Uh, but this patient was ha was having chronic stable heart failure before, and when suddenly either by certain uh, uh, worsening disease or precipitating factors, they suddenly go to acute uh, heart failure. Remember, acute heart failure is always an emergency. Now, with this, let us go for the clinical manifestations of heart failure, and from now on, main uh, description uh, management issue will be on heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, the signs and symptoms are very important and it has been, uh, uh, it has been, uh, it has been uh, cited very elaborately in the ESC uh, guideline, also in many other guidelines. I prefer this one. And here they have got certain symptoms of which some are typical. Everybody of whom we know, whether listeners or company, et cetera, with ankle leader mother is typical. Apart from these, there are some less typical symptoms. We must also have got, uh, uh, should have uh, known these things because we have to uh, identify heart pain. And in the, in the science level, there again, we have got certain specific signs, living, uh, actually signs, like elevated jugular venous, jugular, uh, hepatojugular deep plug, tardarson, etc. And there are a lot of uh, less specific signs. Remember, Heart failure do not have a single sign or sim single uh, symptoms with which we can diagnose this thing. And this uh, disease is a progressive disease. If you look over here, once the uh, cardiac function quality try to deteriorate, uh, they deteriorate, and sometimes they have decompensation phases, either in acute decompensation phase and hospitalization. Sometimes in acute phase, they can also die also. So as the prog disease progresses, the steadily, the actually the, uh, the physical signs and, and is, uh, is a physical state is declining. Once it is declining, the motility rate actually increases. So this is a progressive disease with a declining uh, tendency of his heart function and going to end his stage. Uh, now, if we combine all these things, but because this is a clinical syndrome. So you start all the terminology I have used so far. Uh, for example, starting from stage A, it is from the uh, SSA guideline. So if a person is normal, normal means he had got certain risk factors, but no have heart failure. So this characteristic is there is no symptom. Uh, they can exercise normally and their LV function is normal. Also in a symptom, symptom deteriorate, they may have asymptomatic LV dysfunction. This is stage is usually clinically we write, and this is actually scientifically stage B. Here there is no symptom, uh, but no, and there is normal exercise and abnormal left ventricular dysfunction has been diagnosed either by other means such as X-ray or echocardiography. And once they, they compensate, means they start failure. We call that compensated heart failure. Means they still now not decompensate. They are already compensated and enter in the heart failure stage. This is the C. Here again, they, possibly there may be no symptom. They will have a reduced ejection uh, exercise capacity. And of course, they have got abnormal ventricular function. And once they decompensate it, they become stage C. And here again, 
they get the symptom abnormal function and there will be more exercise uh, uh, deterioration and the final stage is stage d and stage d. so this is how uh, we can actually correlate with the stages and clinical uh, clinical terminology and nano ij functional class uh, there are certain worsening factors which actually uh, causes a uh, deterioration of heart failure, either in the form of chronic deterioration or in the form of acute decompensatory heart failure. Uh, important non cardiac causes are non compliant. This is very important. They usually non compliant to the life changes, they also non compliant to medication. Sometimes newer medication, when the medication has changed, they become uh, uh, decompensated. Renal dysfunction, infection, pulmonary embolism, M and anemia is very important. And there are certain cardiac causes which can uh, worsen heart failure. One is atrial fibrillation, other tachyarrhythmias, bradycardia or heart block, and worsening heart, heart disease. Those patients who are having valvular heart disease, there may be deterioration in the valvular function. And myocardial ischemia and infarction is, of course, an important part uh, for the hyper heart failure patient to be taken care of. And if we see that what is the main causes of readmission in the hospital, you see most of the most half of the cases are the non-adherence either to diet or non-adherence to the prescription medication. There are other, but and an important aspect in our, our society is now, but it is definitely in the Western society, the failure to seek care to the, uh, by the patients or the family, that is important. And you can see 16% patient, they are using inappropriate prescription medication. So you see over here, over two thirds of the heart failure readmissions can be prevented if these uh, can be well addressed. And another aspect is the sudden cardiac death clinically. This is uh, very common in uh, heart failure. Approximately 50% deaths are due to sudden cardiac death. And in, the sudden cardiac death is primary mode of death in patients with less severe heart failure. This is to be very important we must care of because uh, this is a common belief that the more severe the heart failure, possibly sudden death will occur more in those phenotype. No, the, those who have got uh, less severe heart failure, they are more prone to die suddenly. Uh, sudden cardiac risk factors are many, as I've told already, there may be coronary heart disease, maybe a refunction, symptomal history, and symptomatic ventricular arrhythmias. And sometimes some antiarrhythmic drugs actually increases the uh, uh, sudden cardiac death. And definitely these three drugs, AC inhibitor, beta blockers, and MRA, I mineral cortical receptor antagonist, actually uh, decreases the sudden cardiac risk. Now, <clears throat> with this background, let us go for diagnostic evaluation. Uh, here, to begin with, uh, I must say the famous saying by Sir Thomas Lewis in 1933, the very essence of cardiovascular practice is early detection of heart failure. Heart failure is so important. If you detect early, you can do much better. But if you detect later, possibly you can't do anything or you can do two very uh, meager things. So diagnostic evaluation should be the full evaluation of the heart failure because the consideration of many things. One is the underlying abnormal of the heart, the type of cardiac dysfunction, especially heart failure with preserved ejection or reduced ejection fraction. And the severity of this syndrome is very important. Etiology, precipitating cause, and uh, worsening factors should be uh, taken care of. And identification of the comorbidity is very important because uh, this is very important for the management and uh, estimation of prognosis. Clinical assessment is very important, and we should have a detailed uh, medical history and a focused physical exam and with some objective assessment for, for general use, for example. Uh, to uh, identify cardiac structure and function uh, by using echocardiography or other modalities and laboratory evaluations. And the commonly used, these tests should be done for all patients who are clinically diagnosed as heart failure. ECG, uh, actually there is no specific changes. Uh, up to 10% patient may have a normal ECG. Cone finding are sinus, tachycardia or bradycardia, arrhythmias and some sort of ischemia and conduction defects. Chest X-ray, again, cardiomegaly and pulmonary congestion then can be easily diagnosed with a prominent epidural low vessel uh, and sometimes in some cases with uh, plural effusion. Natriuretic paper is very important because this has got very diagnostic and prognostic value. Echocardiography is very important for systolic and identify systolic and dysfunction and for various causes and complications like this. And definitely there are some routine uh, blood uh, 
test, the lab test, uh, to identify other causes or there or not, or to evaluate, say, say diabetes, thyroid function, etc. Uh, this is a sorry. Uh, in chest X, I have told earlier that uh, sometimes we can have cardiomegaly with pulmonary congestion. There may be increased pulmonary venous pressure and may reveal alternative diagnosis, say, for example, uh, heart failure or effusion, etc. Et and sometimes you can diagnose uh, valvular or pericardial calcification like this. So chest X-ray is a very cheaper test and easy level everywhere. And we should understand, we should try to understand uh, what the chest X-ray tells about the causes and findings of the, of the patient with heart failure. The next important issue is the natural pressure. pressure. Uh, 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 all of we know that basically a TL by uh, just releases ANP, uh, which is usually volume and pressure dependent. But most importantly, we use BNP and NT pro BNP, and they increase either the, uh, either with the separate, uh, left ventricular systolic or diastolic dysfunction, some form of ventricular dysfunction, even some right ventricular dysfunction. So these three, these two uh, natriuretic peptides usually we use for diagnosis and for disease severity assessment. Now, uh, this, as you show, that these biomarkers increases in response to microbial uh, wall stress, I have already told, and are modified by heart failure therapy. This is the important aspect by which we can monitor, we can change doses, we can increase or decrease these doses uh, of the uh, 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 therapy we use. It can be used to predict future outcomes and guide high plan therapy. And most importantly, most of the important uh, guidelines, they have endorsed this uh, as one of these things. And uh, if the patient has got a normal, normal uh, NP, possibly the patient does not have heart failure. And this is the uh, upper limit of uh, patient, uh, of upper limit of uh, NFID peptides, uh, NP, 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 and anti for non-acute setting and acute setting. Remember, there are some difference between the acute setting and non-acute setting. So if this is for, uh, for your reference, if we should try to remember this. Then another important aspect is the echocardiographic epilation heart failure. Echocardiography is definitely a method of choice for cardiac examination. And from here, we get uh, the information about the, of the chamber volume, systolic and diastolic function, wall thickness, valve function, and pulmonary uh, hypertension we can readily can document with this test. Uh, now, <clears throat> we can diagnose the condition predisposing or complicating heart failure by this. See, what are the echo findings? By echo finding, we can identify the anatomical defects. Say, for example, HD and VHD. We can identify or assess the valvular pathology, say, outing and mitral valve. Pericardial disease, we can, by, by doing it, we can find chronic pericarditis, constitutive pericarditis, or effusion. Uh, we can use uh, this by, by identifying almost an abnormality in ischemic heart disease. And uh, we can also have architectural changes in myocardium in case of hypertensive heart disease, cardiomyopathy, and some infiltrative diseases. And definitely, we can estimate pulmonary uh, artery pressure to in cases of pulmonary hypertension, especially primary pulmonary hypertension and core pulmonary. And of course, sometimes a long-term uh, heart failure patient may have some uh, ventricular uh, complication like intramural thrombus or reduced compression and aneurysm formation. So these are the aspects we can identify by this uh, echocardiography. And what are the measurements actually we do and what are the indications and modalities we use uh, for the echocardiographic evaluation of heart failure. Uh, the ejection fraction is actually major to classify the, the risk uh, classification. Uh, usually we can quantify the MR uh, by color and cardiovascular, uh, 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 by color and uh, continuous Doppler. Uh, annular velocity is usually uh, systolic, sorry, diastolic function and filling pressure, usually done by either uh, 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 pulse wave tissue Doppler or color tissue Doppler. 
LA volume uh, actually used to the, for diastolic evaluation by 2D or 3D. Right ventricle assessment is important for prognosis evaluation for acid devices. By right ventricle system, in coronary artery disease and regional uh, time of motion uh, for site of greatest ma maximal delay for CRT selection. So this is in short and a very uh, organized way I have uh, presented to you. The, what are the measurements we should do and what are the indications what to do and how can we can uh, aspect it. And there are some investigation. This is investigation is normal, not for all patients, but No, this is not heart failure again, but if it's positive, uh, so this is go for, go for echocardiography. Sometimes if it's not available, I can go directly to echocardiography. And if the echocardiography, by echocardiography diagnosis is confirmed, then you can go for uh, treatment. And of course, after that, we must determine the etiology of the uh, patient. Now, management and therapy. Uh, management and therapy uh, basically is a coordinated input. You should uh, request a coordinated input of a multidisciplinary team of detected cardiologists. This is known as one man job. And we must have a heart failure specialist, rehabilitation nurses, primary care physician like GPs, and palliative care specialists. The key to the successful management of these patients is a prompt diagnosis in the community. We must try to diagnose this patient in the community because there are a lot of patients in various st uh, stages are, available, uh, are moving around the world. And they should have proper management in the hospital and access the follow-up and management either by GP, by internist or specialist as and where they need. So this is a complete arrangement should be, uh, should be done. The main goals are prevention and control of the disease, the dysfunction, for example, treatment of hypertension, coronary artery, valvular, et cetera. Then prevention of progression of heart failure. Once that are diagnosed, you are diagnosed with cardiac dysfunction and try to develop, treat the patient or manage the patient whether they, they should not get, go to heart failure stage. And another important aspect is the reduce mobility and improve quality of life by relieving symptoms, increasing exercise capacity, etc. And definitely at the end, we must provide an end of life. Support. And, and uh, following all these, we must try to improve the survival. Uh, this is a very simple in, uh, management in the outline format. So first we have to do is we have to establish the diagnosis and then attempt to determine the etiology and assess the severity of this thing. And then we ask for the lifestyle uh, management, lifestyle management, and try to correct the precipitating or exaggerating factors. And we must have the multidisciplinary approach I have told you earlier. Education of the patient and relatives is very important. And this is often very neglected. And we should monitor the uh, monitor and progress the uh, management according to the findings of the patient. Life patient management, everybody of note that we must uh, have the adhere to the treatment. Symptom recognition is very important because sometimes uh, the patient recognizes their symptom in the very latest stage. Uh, weight man uh, monitoring is important. Diet and nutrition should be advised. Fluid intake, this is very important. And alcohol and smoking suggestion is very important. Uh, physical activity, and definitely we must have vaccination for influenza or other, especially in the elderly people. And coming to the uh, pharmacological management, uh, basically, we, I, I will give some of the drugs, uh, their use, and their complication in, in, in sequence. So the important drug is diuretics, diuretics and it provides basically symptomatic relief of the pulmonary uh, or venous congestion. 
with the exception of a uh, mineral corticoid uh, uh, antagonist uh, antagonist diuretics do not offer any significant prognostic uh, benefit loop diuretics causes a more pronounced effect uh, and thiazide diuretic may be used in combination of uh, of the di of loop diuretics if resistant edema uh, but it is essential to monitor potassium sodium and other creatine and other uh, in when you prescribe a, a diuretics AC inhibitor actually unless contraindicated everybody every patient with a ejection fraction less than 40 percent and symptomatic should receive an AC inhibitor. AC is actually reduce mortality and morbidity and definitely improve or at least prevent further deterioration of the ventricular function. And these are the some contraindication uh, of uh, uh, their uh, history, history of angioedema, bilateral renal artery stenosis, serum potassium concentration more than five. And serum creatinine is more than micro, uh, 220. And of course, you should not use in severe aortic stenosis. ARB is almost similar. This should be used in patient with heart failure like uh, AC inhibitor when AC inhibitor is not tolerated available. As with AC inhibitor, this is the same out to finding contraindication as for as for AC inhibitor, except is angioedema. Then we can have the newer drug angiotensin repressor inhibits earning. And the first, first in this class is cyclobutyl valsartan. And this is basically a hybrid drug of ARB and an aneuploidy inhibitor. They provide significant morbidity and mortality benefits for patients with symptomatic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. In chronic stable, <clears throat> now is a class two or three examination. A who tolerated AC inhibitor or ARB can be replaced by ARNI. It is now recommended further to reduce morbidity and mortality. So, uh, if the patient is stabilized in, in RAS blocker, uh, and if you, we want to have a, a better effect, we can replace this with uh, ARNI. The contraindications are similar. Uh, if the patient has got a of angioedema, patients are currently on AC, but they, they should be stopped for 36 hours. In patients with severe hepatic impairment and moderate to severe AS, bilateral renal artery stenosis, and hyperkalemia should be. Uh, should not be given in this patient. Beta, <coughs> beta blockers in heart failure, as you know, that uh, unless contraindication or not tolerated, all patients should, symptomatic patients should receive uh, uh, a beta blocker, uh, which is the benefit ejection fraction is less than 40. Beta blocker reduces mortality and morbidity and improve or at least even further deterioration, as you know. Close monitoring is required. Uh, as there may be an, an initial deterioration, sometimes when after giving beta blocker, patient may deteriorate, symptomatically may deteriorate. For example, the contraindications are everybody knows the patient with severe asthma, regular exacerbation, second, third degree heart valve, sinus node disease, or severe sinus uh, bradycardia. Uh, mineral corticoid uh, antagonist in heart failure, MRIs are indicated in a patient with elevated dysfunction less than 55, and severe symptomatic uh, patients also. Uh, the, those who are not uh, uh, improved with optimal doses of AC inhibitor, ARB, and beta blocker. MRIs reduce both mortality and number of hospital rehabilitation, secondary to deteriorating heart failure symptoms. There are some, some contraindications serum potassium more than 5 millimole, serum creatinine more than 220 micromole, and in addition to the combination of AC inhibitor and ARB, we certainly. Now, if I now summarize all these things here, uh, these are the core therapies for patients with a heart failure with reserve ejection fraction. AC inhibitor indication is less than 40% uh, uh, different kind, and it reduces mortality and hospitalization. Beta blockers also reduces mortality and mortality indicated in patients with less than 40% ejection fraction. MRI, as I've already told you. ARBs, again, uh, they're similar with the uh, AC inhibitor and the other diuretics other than MRAs usually include those patients who are having frequent congestion and repair repeated hospitalization. hospitalization. Now you see the effect, patient effect of the RAS inhibitors. Here again, we have uh, compared the four RAS inhibitors. One is AC inhibitor, ARBs, beta blocker, mineral particle antagonist. Here you can see approximately uh, AC, inhib AC inhibitor or ARB but reduces mortality approximately by 18% and uh, by MRA around 13%. But look, 
beta blocker again input, uh, is very important it is it reduces around 30 30 34 percent so all the drugs reduces mortality some are more uh, some are less now if we com consider the two important ras blocker one is arb another is ac inhibitor they combinedly reduce approximately 15 to 18 and the army actually added the reduction of more 20 percent of uh, reduction of mortality so considering all these the patient should should uh, consider for their use now digoxin in the heart failure patient is useful beta block useful to aid beta block to reduce atrial fibrillation rate it should be considered in symptomatic patient despite of uh, omt of premium medical therapy that is uh, this three drug irrespective of the need for heart rate control sometimes you can use it reduces hospitalization and symptoms, but uh, confers no survival benefit. A uh, high serum concentration is associated with the increased mortality. So we should remember this one. And contraindication a significant bradycardia or second or third degree heart block uh, without pacemaker and pre acceptance syndrome. We should not use injection fraction. The another important but, but very rare use in our country is hydrologin as a sorbite dinitride in heart failure. This combination is added to HNV with ARB and beta blocker and provides an additional morbidity and morbidity, morbidity benefit for this. The combination is used as an alternative to HNV with ARB in patients who do not tolerate the drug or as an addition to the patient with uh, optimal medical therapy, uh, therapy who remains symptomatic. And uh, these are uh, contraindications. This is contraindication for uh, hypertension, uh, symptomatic hypertension, lupus, severe patient. Another important aspect regarding uh, hydrologin and uh, isosorbate dinitride is this is very effective those in those patients who are African descent. Uh, Imabaridine uh, is, is a selectively inhibitor funny, uh, uh, funny current blocker, and they reduce the lower, uh, they reduce the heart rate. When they're used, the indication is usually are the patient with stable symptomatic chronic heart failure, left ventricular ejection fraction less than 35, sinus rhythm with resting heart rate more than 75, despite targeted dose of beta blocker, or when beta blocker therapy is contraindicated. Side effects usually have got asymptomatic or symptomatic bradycardia, maybe there, and visual effect is usually blurring of vision and flashing. Contraindication is sinus nose uh, dysfunction, pacemaker dependent patients and concomitant use of verapamil or diltigen and a high or third degree heart block. Uh, this drug should not be used. Now, these are the drugs I have already told that which can be used in what situation, what are the contraindications. Now, look, there are certain drugs we must avoid. Medicine for which evidence of benefit is lacking. This is very important. Whatever, whoever it is, you must ask for the evidence. What is the evidence for use of this drug for heart failure patient. Agents which are harmful, this should be avoided. Say, for example, rate limiting uh, calcium blocker increases mortality morbidity, oral hyperchloration also uh, causes fluid reduction, metformin rel relatively contraindicated. In a sense, everybody we know that. End. And there are certain cancer therapies <coughs> are associated with uh, cardiac toxicity. Uh, Amiodarone and donodarone are not uh, uh, absolutely contraindicated, but uh, should be avoided unless there is a clear indication for that. And that must be given by the specialist, especially the <coughs> EP and arrhythmologist. Now, comorbidities. Regarding comorbidities, why, why comorbidities are very important? Because the drugs used to treat comorbidities may interact and can cause worsening heart failure. Most comorbidities are associated with worse clinical status, and they have got poor prognosis in heart failure. Uh, there are a lot of comorbidities, but I will uh, discuss in short. The, uh, following four comorbidities, one diabetes, actual fibrillation, dysfunction, uh, anemia and uh, anemia or iron disease. Comorbidities like diabetes, the drugs of both the 
use and those other things. Uh, then usually uh, use of thiodine and uh, the core inhibitors, uh, but important aspect is AGLT2 inhibitors very important, and we use uh, this one. You can see on the right side, if we do not treat with the uh, 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 AG2 inhibitor, you see the parameters are worsened. But once you treat this with Inhibitor. And you can see the improvement of cardiac effect by this. So, AAVs are now being high treatment heart failure uh, by error, pressure for error. We do it for that. Monitoring and treatment should jump uh, 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 actually, it increases the patient as a major impact on, on our management. If you see over here, there's a heart failure and atrial failure. So, a lot of they take a cardiac ending pressure and so on and this and sometimes they've got fibrosis giving the rest of the so they are interrelated even they have got in chamber enlargement light enlargement then there are some uh, electrophysiologic uh, aspect of the heart so again we have to understand this thing so atrial fibrillation and heart failure basically is a vicious pathophysiological cycle where one deteriorates the other and uh, as a whole, that to rest the patient. Uh, regarding the management aspect, uh, we must say so. Uh, treatment consideration of this: the for all patients, oral anticoagulation or liposomal modification, optimization of uh, guideline-directed medical therapy should be given. Rate control is very important, and catheter ablation is a provisioning therapy for heart failure patient in home. Last thing, uh, rhythm control is desired. So that's only. So there is uh, one as recently published uh, in the heart journal, can treat, uh, uh, can treat method or algorithm for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction at L fibrillation. So this is CAN is for cardioversion, A is for anticoagulation, and N is for a normalized fluid balance. And then treat is for target initial heart rate, say less than 110, and then you are to treat renin angiogenesis engine system, then to, you, to hourly consider the rhythm control, and advanced heart failure therapy should be given and treatment of other uh, cardiovascular diseases. So this thing you can simultaneously or gradually, if you remember, they can treat uh, algorithm. Possibly we can treat uh, uh, heart failure. As our population, heart failure population is growing age, atrial fibrillation would be more and we have to treat more cases of this. Then lastly, we come to anemia and iron deficiency. Iron and anemia deficiency are extremely important. Uh, it affects approximately 50% of all ambulatory patients. Patient. And the cutoff values have been already prescribed, so example, serum ferritin less than 100 picogram per liter, ferritin between 110 when the saturation is uh, 20%. And again here, we can have an algorithm for diagnosis of iron deficiency and heart failure. Uh, firstly, you see whether the patient is heart failure or not and try to uh, identify whether the patient is having uh, iron deficiency. These are the, the, the normal values. If yes, then go for whether the patient is has anemia or not. If no anemia, uh, just consider uh, 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 iron deficiency treatment only. And again, if there is no uh, iron deficiency, go for anemia. If there is uh, no anemia, so no treatment. If there is anemia, and then go for identify the causes and try to treat any. Uh, iron deficiency patient, the active screening for the patients with anemia and iron deficiency is recommended for all hyperal patients, the guidelines, and intravenous ferric carboxymaltose should be considered to alleviate symptom. And for this, this is a good uh, algorithm. 
to rhythm. If you have got a symptomatic uh, patient with uh, heart failure with rejection fraction, especially NHA 2 or 3, uh, then see for hemoglobin, it is, if it is less than 15, uh, 15, if it is above the 15, so no iron therapy. If it is more than 15, ask for ferritin and ferritin uh, and, and saturation for this. Uh, if no, then no iron therapy. If this is saturation is also low, uh, low, then we consider for iron therapy. So for IV, IV iron therapy, the important aspect is identify the iron deficiency, then identify the hemoglobin level. If it is anemic, both is negative, then you go for uh, IV iron therapy. Now, device is very simple. This, this part I'll go very quickly uh, regarding the device, ICD therapy. Uh, everybody or person know that it's in a, in a heart failure. And this is a direct, uh, uh, this particular instrument is actually detected thermite titrating ventricular tachycardia uh, with uh, M. By this, they can prevent, uh, uh, by, uh, prevent sudden cardiac death. Technologically, this has been advanced too much, and I think it is better adopted by the patient also. And the NEMA technology has already emerged, that is subcutaneous ISD, and which is very, uh, very, I think, easier to uh, implant. And this actually eliminates the needs for RV pacing and uh, uh, RV, uh, RV transmitter pacing. But this has got give, this has given a similar safety and efficacy to the transmitter ICD system. Uh, yeah, this is uh, the I ICD, and this ICD has got three functions, three chamber. From the atrium, actually, they detect the arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, or atrial valve cutter, and they take the pacing, and cardioversion can be used by this leg. And on the ventricle, also VT VF detection is there, and they take pacing, cardioversion defibrillation. And from both the chamber, atrium and ventricle, actually, we sense bradycardia and bradycardia pacing. So this is the basic function of an ICD program. And this is uh, the uh, ICD. Excellent presentation, sir. Elaborate presentation. More than around 200 participants are enjoying your oh, lectures. Okay. 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 Around 200, sir. In the Zoom class. And Facebook also another, I think. Uh, <clears throat> So well, from here, this is, uh, I have to not, I think, uh, you've been seen, right, before? OK. Uh, now, uh, we can see this is the conventional uh, uh, con conventional pacemaker over here. In the middle, we have the subcutaneous, uh, subcutaneous uh, ICD uh, with the uh, genet on the left side and the, uh, and the lead on the, the lead on the uh, anterior chest. This is the uh, uh, chest X-ray. Now, recombination for ICD, this is very common. Everywhere you can find there are secondary for secondary prevention and for primary prevention. Secondary prevention, those who have the ICD survival, they can use it. Uh, it has uh, hemodynamically instabilities there. And primary, uh, the, these are the reaction. The patient with ischemic heart disease with uh, than five to 40 days and this same patient. And all patients should to be treated with OMT and uh, those who are not not uh, the, uh, the, they work with OMT and more than three months, and they can use also the primary prevention. Uh, this is a, a historical one. This is the first ICD uh, implanted uh, by the then then uh, Professor Atharel and his team in two, uh, 2000, 2000, I think uh, uh, it was two, 2002, 2002 or three. Uh, this was uh, and borrowed. We have got a, this uh, ICD. Uh, 
It is okay, a motion? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Sir, ठीक है sir. ठीक है sir. Yes, sir. So this is uh, this is a forty fifty was a, uh, a certain cardiac arrest survivor, and we got this from a donation from the British company uh, given by uh, Dr. Vikramesh that was implanted, and this patient actually incidentally survived for another five years, and in this five years time he has got about uh, ten to twelve shocks, and ultimately the patient died and in this heart failure. And CRT again, this is important. This is uh, main, uh, many stem therapy nowadays for drug refractory symptomatic patients, and we can have either uh, CRT P only for patient, and again a cardiovascular defibrillator can be added to it. We when we call it CRT D, which can uh, use as a cardiovascular also, defibrillator also. And this is important because what are the recommendations? Are symptomatic patients with uh, Uh, with uh, sinus rhythm, KRS more than 150 is a uh, class one uh, indication, and 130 to 140 is class B invasion where where there is a LV more for this uh, is there. The symptomatic patient with a KRS duration of more than 150 milliseconds, even with non LV more, there is a 2A uh, uh, indication for this. And CRP uh, CRT is usually not used uh, is not indicated in where the Duration is less than uh, 130. Now, uh, if we can summarize this thing, on the, on the left side we have got uh, uh, we have got uh, comparison by RELS by AC inhibitor and AC emitter and aldosterone uh, uh, agonist, and significant reduction is there. In Copernicus studies, we have com compared AC inhibitor aldosterone plus uh, beta blocker. They have got reduced to 12.8 percent mortality uh, mortality. In the heart failure study, we, uh, they compare uh, the with the drug therapy with a CRT therapy. Again, there is significant reduction of it. So you can follow the uh, past history of uh, uh, therapy for heart failure, especially heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. We have come a long way from single medicine to combination of medicines or optimum medical therapy. And ultimately, to medical therapy to the CRT. So this is important, and we must understand the position or phases where the patient should be referred to the appropriate person uh, uh, for the next level of treatment. Uh, this is very simple to understand and to remember. This is from the uh, sign guideline uh, of the British 2016. Uh, this, uh, on the left hand side, you can see the QRS uh, as I told earlier. And in what NOIJ classification, who is type of ICD or CRTD or CRTP would be indicated? Uh, I refer everybody uh, to go for sign or find code two thousand sixteen for this. Uh, the very latest one is the treatment functional MR in chronic heart failure. It's very important because functional MR deteriorates uh, uh, heart failure situation. So very newer one is uh, the task catheter mitral valve repair with a mitral clip. On the left hand side, you can see the. Uh, uh, In a in a uh, picture that uh, this has got a clipping of the mitral valve percutaneously, and this is echocardiographic finding of it. And this is a good algorithm uh, to mean if you if you develop some of the uh, mitral clipping in this country. I think I don't know whether everybody anybody has developed it. Maybe there. Uh, so the algorithm should be the symptomatic uh, second. Secondary uh, mitral regurgitation is there. If it is moderate to severe, that is more than class three, then optimize heart failure therapy and repeat the uh, TT or uh, transcranial echo. Every if the mitral regurgitation improves, that is mitral regurgitation that uh, reduces, then go for medical treatment. And if not, then go for anatomical suitability of the leaflets. Let me section if it's within the five. And whether LV diameter is less than uh, 70 millimeter, then if these are not there, then you can go for other therapy like this. And if it's there, then the patient can be a good candidate for mitral clipping. And mitral clipping can improve uh, cardiac heart failure. There are uh, a few studies. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, There are certain studies uh, which uh, improve the mortality and morbidity benefit by mitral clipping. So 
Now, uh, going to the management of adverse heart failure very quickly. Adverse heart failure actually has a must be a safe addition to palliative care, uh, ventricular assist devices, and heart transplant should be considered. But all the important aspect I want to say, tell everybody that early referral of patients potentially paid for each therapy is an expert center is very much important. Can you mute, uh, please? Uh, if in refractory heart failure, before you re refer, please consider the following. Review the pharmacological and device therapy, ensure the optimal medical therapy, and withdraw any unnecessary or un 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 uh, harmful drugs. Check for any mere iron deficiency. Consider adding digoxin. And opiates sometimes improve breathlessness for certain period. So in these cases, you can see, uh, this is how we can go for this is very clumsy slide. But again, we have got simple cases. But first, you try whether the patient is stable or unstable. If the patient is unstable, maybe there we need a short-term mechanical uh, <clears throat> circulatory uh, assist devices, uh, circulatory support. And if this is patient is stable, then we can win and not, nothing to be done. But if the patient has got no recovery, then assess for the whether the patient will improve or not. If there is irreversible neurological damage, then possibly you can't do anything. But if it is a, a neurological deficit, then you consider for mechanical circuitry, circuitry support, either for breathing, uh, for transplantation, or destination. Uh, destination breathing. So this is how a very simpler way to understand the management of the patient in working. Ventricular assist devices, uh, very simply, what 30,000 such devices have been uh, actually imported in all of the world. And the current devices are smaller, more durable, and associated with better long time. And it's a very, very costly one. Again, adverse events and the need for anticoagulancy is all of the uh, negative side. Uh, it is, this is important. I think every, uh, every guideline has given this indication, so I'm not going to detail. But one important thing is ventricular access devices are mostly used to freeze transplant or destination therapy. This, this is the two main, main, main indication for uh, uh, the chronic VAs. There are certain acute systems that is used in acute uh, uh, heart failure. Maybe if you uh, give a, take a class on acute heart failure, maybe we can discuss on there. So now there are certain surgical options uh, for adverse heart failure. Uh, mostly as the uh, patient in, uh, actually deteriorates, the severity is uh, uh, increased. So maybe there are, uh, we can have coronary artery bypass surgery if there is indication, mitral valve approach if there is indication. Uh, they have got left, uh, left ventriculoplasty by like Pakistan and other, and they can use uh, ventricular assist that already, uh, already described. And we are going to have regenerative therapy maybe in few, few times. And of course, we can have heart transplantation. And uh, this is the indications. Again, these indications are available in all the uh, all the thing. Should be all the thing. But one important thing is there are almost five thousand heart transplants uh, are done each year in the world. And there are <clears throat> long term survival after a heart transplant is more than more than 10, uh, 10 years. So uh, this is the aspect where we should uh, take care of. Especially, I want to. Uh, especially, I want to uh, request the surgical colleague who can uh, go for this. Uh, palliative care, again, is a uh, two term we can use the palliative care and hospice. Palliative care is uh, designed to improve quality of life for patients and their families. Uh, and hospice is a term is used to des describe a specific mode of palliative care offered in patients who are at the end of life with a terminal disease when curative or life prolonging therapy is no longer a focus. Uh, actually, uh, the palliative care has been started for the ca cancer patient worldwide. And even in our country, we have got a good uh, palliative care center in uh, BSMMU, uh, is, uh, is, is now uh, headed by Professor Nazamuddin. And maybe we can talk with him and we can use a palliative care center in the National Institute of Cardiovascular Disease and Tata Community Clinical Centers. This is very important for this. And uh, this is how this integration, I have uh, almost I came to the uh, last end of it. Uh, we can integrate the uh, palliative care with the traditional cardiovascular care. So first of all, we can get patient from where? We can get it from inpatient 
from GN medical clinics, from GN cardiology clinics, from primary care, and they have a, they should have integrated heart failure services. As I have already, uh, already told, they have got, uh, we should have heart failure cardiologists, heart failure specialist nurses, electrophysiologists, pharmacists, etc., and physiotherapists. And once the diagnosis and the patients may go up and down, we can try to assess patient for diagnosis treatment and long term management. And if needed, we can go for primary care, hospice, advanced heart failure, or for general cardiology. So this should this type of integration is very much important because we are use a disease which is much dangerous than uh, many of the cancers. And this is very important aspect uh, uh, of the treatment. Uh, this has been given by uh, in the European Cardiology Review uh, article. Very simple. This is summary on the last side, possibly. Uh, if you see on the left side, is step one. You have to step the diagnosis and give for. Uh, this particular uh, picture is also available in the Brown World, uh, Brown World 2019. Uh, so here, if they have got a stage three heart failure with this absorption, then the drug, the optimal drug should be given. And in step two, consider the following patients in uh, patient scenarios. So the, these patients may have different scenarios. For example, the patient has got a less than 30% creatine clearance, less than 5%. You can use for LSON or MRA, etc. And uh, patient uh, uh, with energy class and uh, in black, and out of the, they can use with hydrology patient, especially. And you have seen the indications for CRT and other things here. And of course, sometimes you can go for that. So step three indications, then a step three, sorry, step two and step three indications to be added. And in step four, if the patient is still persists, symptom still persists, that is refractory patient stage D, or patient stage D, then you have to go for the right thing, palliative care, transplant, or interventional studies as I told Michael Cleave. If the patient is not symptomatic, then possibly you can uh, continue for like, so if we stage this patient like this, possibly we have a better result and better quality of life for these particular patients. With this, uh, dear friends and ladies and gentlemen, I stop over here. Uh, I am very sorry for uh, this. Uh, uh, maybe uh, this is very long uh, classes plus. Uh, so now it is open for discussion. Thank you very much. And especially I thank for the course director, both of the course directors uh, of IPDI. Uh, for giving me the chance of it. And if you like, you can ask me for an uh, management of acute uh, heart failure and maybe two to, two to three weeks later. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, everybody. Thank sir, you, sir. Thank you, sir. It's our As usual, sir, elaborate, sir. Excellent. It's a, it's a privilege to listen to you. And so I have this a hard, such an elaborate and encompassing, all encompassing lecture on heart failure. And you have covered all the uh, facets that should be given attention to. And that's very nice of it. Uh, we have lots of questions. I think we'll be having uh, some more questions as well. Uh, so I think, Bosin, you can go on. Sir, sir, uh, thank you. How, how can I go for the screen? Stop skin, sir. Bosin? Stop skin, sir. Oh, stop skin. Stop yeah. Share, no? yeah, stop share. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Atar is there, no? Device Atar, is there. Atar, Atar is, sir. Do you hear me, sir? Uh, Mosin, I'm going to video. I'm going to video. I'm going to video. Atar is, sir. Do you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can hear you, Mosin. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. We are hearing you, sir. Oh, yes, I can hear. Yes, sir. Please give comment, sir, on lecture. Oh, yes, comment. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Mohsin. Really, it was a, uh, Sir has summarized several talk in a single lecture, I think. And all information in a systematic way, step by step. Sir has collected multiple information from several books and journals. Really, it was a wonderful lecture. I think the Personally, my myself and I think the audience will be. Uh, I think nothing will be left 
after reading this lecture really it has a, so much to elaborate all the information what i want to know everything in this lecture so this, this is an outstanding lecture so this is my comment just i uh, this is not a question just one thing i want to know from sir sir can i ask a comment sir hello yes. sir yes uh, yes sir yes sir sir in the pioneer heart failure study the uh that is a uh, stabilized acute heart failure patient just i want to know sir still we are hesitant to use the uh, early in case of the acute heart failure what is the actually ideal criteria sir when to use the uh, uh, that is a early in case of the acute heart failure not in the chronic sir acute heart failure uh, basically uh, uh, that that is not a, a, a evidence based but uh, some of the some of the later we found that they can they use but unless you have given evidence uh, this is uh, there is not uh, this is not uh, uh, should be generalized but if you know the patient you can monitor the patient very carefully and if there is no standard contraindication for army then army failure uh, in in that case in acute cases uh, that you can use one important aspect is the treatment of uh, acute heart failure and chronic heart failure acute heart failure definitely is a different phenotype and this has got again a different type of uh, uh, pathophysiology different types of uh, uh, of the renin angiogenic system so that is important so to my knowledge goes uh, that is that can be used and so used by somebody but uh, it is not yet been yet been uh, uh, taken in the guidelines thank you thank sir, sir. Uh, khalid bosin sir yes uh, uh, thank you sir uh, every time sir i hear a lecture by you regarding heart failure i find something new actually yes, so, uh, every time we are never Honestly. short of new information yes uh, actually i want to focus on a topic that the heart failure particularly control of chronic heart failure is difficult in our country in a context that we don't have an organ cardiac rehabilitation program actually when sir was the director uh, i was working under him and his previous director professor jalal sir also tried their best to establish a organized cardiac rehabilitation uh, but uh, unfortunately uh, uh, the it, it didn't uh, proceed Uh, because uh, every patient with a heart failure undergo a formal cardiac rehabilitation but in, in unfortunately in our country we don't have this so we, this uh, aspect should be addressed uh, as soon as possible and another thing regarding uh, the presence of mitral regurgitation as sir has said that we sometimes devascularize a patient with the hope that the mitral regurgitation will reduce the ischemic mr but unfortunately in some patient it doesn't reduce or it tends to progress further and this patient fare very badly in this group of patient as uh, we don't have mitral clip we should consider about the surgical revascularization of this patient so that they have a better outcome in in long term thanks again sir for your uh, beautiful presentation thank you sir Uh, Professor Prabir from Jhelum, Jhelum. Professor Prabir Kumar. Sir, sir, thank you, sir. Sir, thank this you, is Prabir. Thank you. 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 Thank so this is the lecture comparable to uh, that lecture delivered by eugene brownall very nice very informative sir everything Thank covered you. nothing to uh, query but one thing sir if we consider heart failure and renal failure uh, side by side they have changed that terminology in acute renal failure they now use acute kidney injury in case of chronic renal failure they use chronic kidney disease but we are continuing the terminology heart failure this is okay for ourselves but if a patient hears his heart is failing then possibly <laughs> his mortality will be increased all the more he will be psychologically a bit uh, 
this is my observation, sir, my, my own uh, uh, appreciation regarding heart failure. Secondly, Mahashin. sir, the classification given latest, latest stage in given stage A, B, C, and D. Patient having hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipid dyslipidemia is given, is labeled as having stage A heart failure. So, and your definition, and you started with signs and symptoms of heart failure. In absence of any signs and symptoms, labeling a person for mere somewhat, uh, uh, to me, it is inhuman, but it is given by SCC and ASA, you have nothing to do with it. But it is somewhat, Amra Bangla Jeta Bolisar, it is Manavadigar Longonar Pajayasar. It is our Nijasho, uh, my opinion, may, may not be shared by many other peoples. So what I think, sir, in future, possibly the terminology of heart failure will not be existent. It will be cardiac dysfunction or some, some terminology like that. What do you think, sir? Please give your comment. Uh, I consider <laughs> Prabir uh, uh, yeah, to human, and I also uh, put in some input, sir. Yeah. But uh, the thing is that actually, even when this uh, uh, SEC staging was published first, uh, even then this uh, controversy was there. But you, if you remember that they have given this classification in the heart uh, heart failure guidelines, but they not they do not tell that this is heart failure. And for that reason, I have divided into the two parts, not me, this is by the guidelines from the group. Uh, the, the first two stages are at risk of heart failure. They are not at heart failure, they are at risk of heart failure. And stage C and D have got they given that at a stage of heart failure. And if you uh, remember the slides where we com uh, compile all these things, you see that stage A and B has got no NOIHF classification of symptoms. So actually heart failure in fact had a basically a symptom. Again, the heart failure have got a tremendous, tremendous uh, from say four or five decades of uh, from there, even uh, from the ACC guide. So it has been changed. And these change has actually improved the heart failure. Or definitely, the uh, terminology is being is not a uh, fixed one. It will be changed. Uh, possibly, your uh, concern, uh, uh, the those people who are working on it are going to uh, do it. So here that again, I've not uh, given that uh, what is renal failure. I have actually used the term renal dysfunction because basically yeah. when cardiologists uh, compare with the heart failure renal function, they usually use the term renal dysfunction. Thank you. So here we can choose the, some term like pre-heart failure, like in diabetes. Right, sir. Uh, Probably Probita is very much right. I, I okay. also think that this is, is something <laughs> Oh, okay. too much. This perception is uh, pretty fine. Bobir's perception is pretty fine. Thank you. Sir, uh, there is a term known as... Jalaluddin, sir, we ask. Professor Jalaluddin. Sir, do you hear me, sir? Jalal, sir. Then, uh, then. Jalal, sir. Please unmute, sir. Please unmute. Okay, uh, Mahmoud uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, it's a great privilege. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a great privilege to listen to our teacher, Professor Nuzul Islam, sir. Uh, sir, I have got one question for you, sir. Uh, that is, in patients with atrial fibrillation with a heart failure, which should be the first rate limiting drug? Is it a beta blocker or deoxin? Uh, basically, uh, basically, if uh, it is a beta blocker because uh, beta blocker has got some motility benefit, which a dejoxin doesn't have. So, uh, so that idea is to start with a beta blocker. And you have, as I have shown there, in the second point is if it is not controlled, you can try with uh, additional of, uh, of a, uh, a dejoxin in that time. But so dejoxin has got. 
dejoxin has its own effect when uh, symptomatic improvement is not there, then at the end, dejoxin is there. Actually, uh, say 10 to 20 years ago, dejoxin was uh, become already obsolete. But now again, it is coming in different way. And beta blocker with dejoxin now is uh, now considered that if the heart rate control is not enough with a single drug, they can you can uh, you can add both. So personally, I think if there is no contraindication, then I start with the beta blocker, increasing the dose to the guideline direct targeted dose if the patient can tolerate. Uh, because beta blocker has got uh, motility, mobility benefit than uh, dejoxin. Sir, can I add something? Uh, yes, sir. Of course. Uh, yes. I prefer in case of acute heart failure where the patient is very much congested. We always tell that make the patient dry, then start the beta blocker. Yes. You yes. start ACE inhibitor or ARP or ARNI earlier. And yes. when the patient is dry, start beta blocker. In that case, yes. initially we can start yes. digoxin. But when we've had yes. a start beta blocker, we have to increase the dose and withdraw the digoxin. That's what Sal is putting emphasis on. Hmm. Dioxin doesn't have any added benefit unless if the beta blocker can do the work. Amal sir, Professor Amal Kumar Chaudhary, please ask your question. Thank you, sir. Nozul sir, I put the our our Chaudhary Jarachi je uni our direct teacher. I mean, when register sila, I mean, good class. I mean, uni ona shatalap kori class di. I mean, ona class I mean, ekku nae boshi dakkam pichane. प्रथम दिखाई মানে পুরাটা এক লেকচার আনা সম্ভব না স্যার আমরা এই প্যাশনগুলো ইসকেমিক ইটিওলজি অর ইডিওপ্যাথিক ইটিওলজি সেকেন্ডারি টু রাইট লেফট হার্ট ফেলার রাইট হার্ট ফেলার হয় উইথ পালমোনারি হাইপারটেনশন উইথ আরভি ডিসফাংশন এখানে কি স্যার আমাদের এক্সট্রা কোন ড্রাগ রাইট সাইড অফ দা হার্ট ফেলারে অ্যাড্রেস করতে হবে স্যার স্পেশাল কোন ড্রাগ বেসিক্যালি রাইট হার্ট ফেলিয়র when associated with left heart failure and dilated dilated left ventricular alignment so the two aspect is the patient both the ventricle is overloaded and the effective rejection fraction is been reduced so the basic thing is try to add all the uh, optimum drugs as possible to reduce the size of the heart and see what is the mitral degradation reducing or not i have shown in the algorithm that if you have got yet uh, three or four mitral degradation first thing is to stabilize it if the mr reduces possibly uh, uh, pharmacologic therapy can continue and the second one this question was asked even in the earlier uh, some earlier uh, lecture by professor arthur that the, what about right ventricular failure ventricular heart one an important aspect is dilatation of right sided heart failure has got two aspects one is from left heart failure and giving right to pulmonary pressure higher or there are certain pulmonary cause which have got improved uh, increased pulmonary hypertension and thereby right sided failure is there an important aspect is the right ventricular right ventricular hypertension and diuretics should be very cautiously very uh, used and for uh, pulmonary or primary pulmonary hypertension uh, there are certain uh, drugs uh, as you know that uh, pda pi other thing can be used so again that was most of these drugs either have got a uh, class 2a indication or 2b indications none had uh, sorry uh, either uh, 2b indication most of the most of the drugs so the basic thing is full assessment of the patient and try to understand what is the hemodynamic effect for this patient and what is the structural heart disease which is giving some uh, factor for this uh, this patient for example Uh, if we have got mitral valve disease with rheumatic origin, possible surgical therapy is better. Uh, but where is the functional MR? Functional MR, and try to see whether the annular dilatation is there, portal rupture is there. So there will be different of uh, situations. But important aspect is uh, uh, aspect is that we have to understand and we have to uh, stratify the patients according to the etiology. According to their NOIC classification, according to their heart rate, 
according, according to the effective ejection fraction and associated condition. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Arun Maske, do you hear me? Dr. Arun Maske? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I hear yeah. you. Yeah. Hi, first. No, sir. But, uh, sir, but I, I can I'm see, I Maske cannot from see Nepal. Arun Maske. Is it from Nepal? Yeah, I'm here. Arun Maske. Yeah, I'm seeing Maske, everybody. Yeah. I cannot see you. But my video is on. Video sir, is on, uh, but I can hey, you have to, uh, Sir, you have to uh, change the... Uh, uh, I think I think Dr. Rafi is sharing his screen. That's creating the problem. Dr. Rafi, Dr. Rafi, Dr. Rafi, Dr. Rafi please unshare your screen. Please unshare your screen and unshare. Uh, stop your video. No, no, no. Unshare your screen. Dr. Rafi. Okay, I am not sharing anything. Sir, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm you, you, uh, Rafi. Rafi, sir, stop I'm not video. sharing anything. Okay, sir, I'm. It's, I have stopped, stopped video, sir, and I'm uh, not Dr. Rafi, better you, better you leave sir. the session and yes. come back again. Okay, sir, I'm leaving. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, okay, now is it? <clears throat> okay, Orun, please. Dr. Orun, 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 Maske, Orun please. Maske. Yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, 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 of course. Oh, I yeah. see you also, Orun. yes. Oh, yeah, with, yeah. A yeah. Night, with a nice background here, yeah, Maske. Yeah. It's got a no, nice it's, screen. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't sir? It was nice lecture from you. You are my teacher when I was in NICVD. It's always a pleasure to uh, attend your lectures. It was covered so much. I don't have any question, questions to ask to you because you have covered everything. Only question to Atar if is here. How often do you practice device-based therapy in Bangladesh? We talk a lot about uh, guideline-based therapy. So... How often do you practice this uh, device-based therapy? Is Atarvai here? Atarvai, sir, do you hear? CRTD, Atarvai, sir, here. Atarvai, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Atarvai, I can hear you. So how, how often do you practice uh, I came to Bangladesh quite a couple of times, but I couldn't meet you. Nice to see you here. Atta, right. Okay, Atta, thank you very much. Welcome, uh, Orun Maske, and for your nice question, particularly regarding the Bangladesh. Actually, this is a complimentary question to Professor Nuzul Sir, Lake Sir, but still I am answering to your question as because the device therapy in Bangladesh has started in 2008, independently 2008, in NICBD. In, in there are sporadic one or two cases in Libet, but systematically it has been started in NICB during the leadership of our Professor Nuzul Sir with the just donated 12 devices by Professor Rupi Gudil Sir. It is started from the 2008 and still the number is increasing every year, every year. Uh, nowadays, over the last two years, two to three years, the rate of implantation of ICD, CRTP and CRTD Nearly 150, 200 in Bangladesh, nearly per year. Yearly, 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 yearly. This is the rate of implantation, nearly around 150 per year. The, the rate is still low, as because the access to the patient to this device therapy, there are a lot of limitations, particularly the cost. But still, the rate is increasing, but still, it is less, mass, 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 less than the demand of the nation. So, we are increasing nearly 150 per year. Are you clear? Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Professor Shahabuddin, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your nice, brilliant and complete presentation, including the all aspects of heart failure. I am uh, very much impressed, by not only my, my, I, uh, also the others, the students that uh, listen to your lecture, they have con and convinced that it's a very complete lecture. Sir, I want to ask uh, one question regarding the management aspects of SGL2 uh, inhibitor, its indications, and uh, in the step care management in heart failure. Uh, sir, can you uh, elaborate the things? That is, the there are some drugs that can uh, used to prevent or delay the onset of heart failure or prevention of uh, mortality. 
in this uh, uh, scenario the agl2 can be prescribed or it can be prescribed in symptomatic heart failure thank you sir actually agl2 inhibitor <clears throat> uh, is being used for the initially for the uh, for the uh, diabetes and i think in the two or three days before khalik yeah. zaman was telling that uh, now this drug of possibly becoming a cardiac drug so there are two study going on one is emperor reserve and an emperor uh, uh, reduced and uh, one of the study will come out in october this year and possibly we will have a definite uh, aspect and uh, the next uh, guideline uh, may either in incorporate or uh, discard it according to their findings so still now the other drugs which is main important aspect is that the cardiovascular mortality morbidity is improved with this particular anti diabetic drug who are who are getting as an anti diabetic but is still not as sure that whether this drug will be given only to the uh, only to the patient with heart failure without uh, diabetes uh, maybe uh, maybe that will become later so even the patients with uh, reserve ejection fraction uh, their interim uh, uh, interim aspect is good but we have to wait for the evidence uh, uh, before we uh, tell it as a heart failure i think in this aspect i think professor khalik is if there dr khalik is on uh, he can tell something it dr khalik zaman please sir i am dead sir first sir i yeah. must uh, congratulate and express my gratitude to you for your elaborate lecture and i can still remember my golden days in nicbd when you were director and i was registered and still now your lecture on infective endocarditis and the pacemaker these are now still in my bookshelf that was a very elaborate lecture and very nice lecture which i want to say that your lecture is so much enriched with detailed information as well as updated information i think you will enjoy the lecture second thing is that the question of hgl2 inhibitor basically although it is turning into a heart failure medicine but yet not recommended for patients suffering from heart failure it is prescribed in a patient with diabetes who are considered to be stable uh, uh, and they can be prescribed it has been shown that those patients suffering from diabetes mellitus the onset of heart failure can be delayed due to their diabetic effect natriuresis effect apart from the there are certain effects that they improve the endothelial function they prevent the apoptosis and so on so these are the beneficial effects they can delay the onset of the heart failure in diabetic patient but there is still no recommendation that patient with heart failure can be prescribed with hgl2 inhibitors the studies are ongoing that will tell in tell in future whether these are can be prescribed in heart failure without diabetic Uh, without having no diabetes this is the main aspect of recommendation second one thing is in, uh, i want to ask sir another question or the panelist uh, the patient for suffering from heart failure has got concomitant renal impairment this used to tell cardio renal syndrome kidney disease has more prone to develop cardiac disease and in another way cardiac disease patient are more prone to develop renal disease so the renal disease Uh, who are suffering from renal impairment likely to have hyperkalemia the drugs we are using we are using we have called got miracle effect like uh, arni and this inhibitor here we has got effect on the creatinine as well as potassium if we use these drugs in spite of hyperkalemia with concomitant use of potassium lowering drug is there any problem number 1 number 2 is that The patient with renal failure, if the patient cannot tolerate these inhibitors or RNA due to hyperkalemia or rising creatinine, alternate drug is atrazine and nitrate combination. We are hearing the name of the drugs from our student life, but yet the yet then there is no company that has marketed these drug combination. Although it has a theoretical good advantage uh, over. The patient with heart failure having venous dilatation, arterial dilatation, reducing after load and glucose. But this drug, why not? It is gaining any popularity in Bangladesh. Can you tell, Professor uh, Nagar? Thank you, sir. Thank you, all the panelists. Uh, coming to your second point, actually, that is also my point that why uh, we are not using isosorbide dinitrate and uh, the hydrolazine. 
So initially, say for example, five, six years ago, maybe, uh, I used to use it as a last resort uh, because we don't have any, uh, any patient of African descent. So we, I usually use in the last resort. Uh, and at that time, isosorbid mononucleotide was available and hydrologin also available separately. So we used, uh, I used to do it. But that is not a very co common practice and not very large practice. So this should be actually tried because uh, many of the patients, our, our patients are having uh, advanced heart, heart failure. Uh, they are not able to go for CRT or other things, or even uh, or, or even other drugs, costly drugs. So that is uh, that is important. So uh, that is important for uh, for our country at least. I have asked some of the uh, company people, uh, what about this? Basically, they said, okay, sir, this is good. I will do it. At, I'll try it. But at the end, they don't have because they have got their own uh, way of thinking uh, of taking drugs. So that is uh, important. But I personally think that that should be available for our country for different reasons. Uh, number one. Number two is regarding renal dysfunction and heart failure. Sometimes it's very difficult who has uh, gone up uh, before or which is uh, which has, uh, developed later. So you have seen in my slides, I have given one important slide, which is also available in many books, that there is various inter interaction between the renal function and for the other uh, and for the cardiac function and in fact in uh, previously it was thought two type of theory of developing heart failure one is hemodynamic theory where uh, whether cardiac dysfunction was initiated and they develop it and other was the uh, the, uh, the renal uh, function renal the cardio renal uh, uh, methodology has been uh, prescribed so in fact all the all the aspects as we correlated actually we do not know which is started, which is starts earlier. So if we get renal dysfunction starts earlier, so she can go to the renal system because the rain, uh, kidney and renal function and glomerulogy are an important uh, uh, aspect of the renal angiotensin system. And the renal angiotensin products are important target of heart disease. Heart. So Sutra, no. So we can uh, we can see try to understand the basic pathophysiology by starting from history to various uh, various invasive and non-invasive uh, uh, finding and of course the biochemical one the biochemical one see the natriuretic nat nat peptides the creatinine the renal function very important regarding use of the drugs always we have, we have to uh, uh, take care that the, the patient's uh, renal function uh, secondary to thyroid function that should be that should be cleared up because uh, the patient heart failure patients has got different aspects sometimes it will improve the cardiac function or renal function sometimes it did to be so you have to have a, a proper monitoring for the patient and according to its cardiac function and renal function these drugs should be used and if, if we look in the different guidelines, they have even different upper limits of that. And on that line, you prescribe. So one important thing I want to say is guidelines are guidelines. And they are not laws. So follow the patient very closely, which is sometimes very uh, uh, very impo impossible or very uh, tough for uh, our our practitioners. So that is important. Uh, can Thank I you. add something, Thank sir? You. Yes. Uh, yes uh, sir. In case in case of the uh, SGL2 inhibitors, uh, recently dapagliflozin has been approved uh, for uh, treatment of heart failure, even without diabetes mellitus. Actually, uh, some studies are going on with dapagliflozin as well. The weather low dose amplification can be added on and very interesting thing is that we are not very sure whether the diuretic effect or any other special effect that is responsible for the beneficial uh, action that uh, these SGL2 inhibitors are doing on the heart failure patients they are reducing mortality very few drugs actually can do that they're reducing heart failure hospitalization and remarkably when in practice, when we are using this, we are seeing remarkable improvement of the cardiac function, uh, patient status, physical status, 
also the renal status in with mild renal impairment this patient with improvement of the cardiac status and control of diabetes the renal status also improves and this is very surprising and very rewarding thank you dr shujib uh, and another thing can i add another thing uh, that combination of hydrolazine and nitrate this drug has the effect of reducing mortality even more than ac inhibitors very surprisingly but very less used uh, one of the reason is that hydrolazine uh, actually has some side effect and some contraindications and another thing is that there's not available in our yeah, our country i agree with you sir we could have had use some of this नेपाल Uh, late 90s, uh, maybe 99 and uh, it's nice, nice to see you and hear you, and uh, hear the, the lecture you have presented, which is very great. Uh, there's one question I want to ask: uh, What's the role of this funny current blocker ibravudine in heart failure? Because it doesn't have the sympathetic property of beta blocker; it only reduces the heart rate. And then uh, that the heart rate is a function of heart failure. I mean, if the heart heart failure increases, this like compensatory tachycardia. It only reduces the compensatory tachycardia. So, what's the mechanism uh, behind this in uh, in the treatment of heart failure? Uh, basically, uh, uh, evapotidine is like, as as we consider the guidelines. This is uh, an indication is to be indication for heart failure. so what are the basic indications the basic indication as you know that a uh, heart rate increased heart rate is uh, one of the important detrimental factor for heart failure patients but if we have to uh, proof that this heart failure is exaggerated but there are some reactive heart failure uh, heart rate tachycardia that should not be touched upon so basic idea is we have to start with if the contraindic if not contraindicated we have to start with the beta blocker along with the ac inhibitors as the heart rate comes down to 70 it has been proved that if your heart rate is below 70 even if it normal and other your longevity is better your heart function will be better that is the whole idea of it in many patient we have seen that uh, the patients uh, when we start uh, heart failure symptomatically slightly improve but not uh, uh, that 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 pass and heart rate is still remains uh, uh, higher say about 100 or like that Uh, even with a beta blocker then the simple heart uh, only heart rate reduction uh, is required evapotidine heart had been heart had been shown that uh, this particular drug has got only the funny channel effect and they reduce uh, heart rate by uh, by reducing the uh, uh, diastolic uh, yeah part of the uh, action potential so they they have said that if the patient must have blood pressure higher than 90 systolic and the patient must have heart rate uh, above 70 because this 70 has been taken because the in beautiful study uh, the first study of evapotidine this was the, their criteria and uh, and their patient with a beta blocker so if the beta blocker does not reduce your heart rate or beta blocker is contraindicated for any reason if a bradin can be used and this indication is class 2b thank you dr rafi doman do you hear me can i add something sir yeah sir of sir. course yes, sir. Uh, of course living part the etiology sr has shown ischemic heart disease perhaps the most dominant uh, factor uh, with along with diabetes and hypertension now the for the heart's uh, own blood supply it depends upon the diastolic pressure and diastolic time so if we have a optimum diastolic time and we are if the patient is having a lower blood pressure if you reduce it further more with beta blocker then we, we are actually compromising the heart own perfusion but in case of evapotidine it reduces the heart rate increases the diastolic time 
So the heart, the coronary arteries get enough supply during the diastole, but without any compromise of the filling pressure, the uh, diastolic pressure. That's the, that's the thing. That's why it works. And Bitfield study have shown the cutoff point above the 70 uh, BPM uh, base per minute, the death rate, mortality rate is higher. And below that is lower. And after certain limit, it's again higher. So for an optimal heart timing, uh, it's actually important. And one thing is that SAR have shown this in a stable patient, you can add after beta blocker or when the beta blocker cannot be used, if only then be used. Thank you, sir. Dr. Rafi Roman, ask you a question. Sujib, how are you nowadays? Sujib, Sujib, how are you? Dr. Sujib, Sujib, they're asking you, how are you now? I'm fine. I'm yeah. fine. I'm fine, sir. Oh, 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 where are you working now? Now, who is working now? Said Gangalal National Heart Center. Oh, uh, Gangalal. Yeah. Okay. Maske, yeah. Thank you. You are with Orun Maski. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Thank nice to meet you. Ravi, Shujit, and Orun for giving me opportunity. Sir, all of them there. Say something. First of all, uh, to Dazu Sam sir, sir, I am very uh, delighted to be here. Uh, it was really a beautiful, neat, and elaborate presentation. And uh, whenever I uh, see your names anywhere, just face of a legend comes to me. And I feel proud to be one of your uh, junior from your Rajshay Government College, sir. I oh. asked my HSC from Rajshay Government College. Oh, okay. And uh, um, many of you here, Mohsen, sir, Wadud, sir, Atar Ali, sir, Piroj, bhai, and Shajul is a very good friend of mine. So, sir, actually, I work in cardiac surgery in United Hospital. I have one question for you, sir. Uh, I don't know actually uh, whether uh, oral form of milrinone, is it available here? And is there any role of oral form of milrinone in heart failure patients? Uh, this uh, has been used in, uh, in the earlier days. But uh, one thing is it's not available in our country. But... Uh, uh, when the patient, this is sort of a supportive type of operative, mainly not at all. There, where we cannot do anything with the standard drug, then that was been given. That, that, but they give only the short time benefit, and mostly those are symptomatic benefit. And that is why, uh, that is why this patient is out of order, uh, out of place now. And that was, of course, this was an important aspect. But as a surgeon, I have got the question: uh, Why don't you start with the surgical aspect? Uh, some of the aspect uh, which, which you can do, and uh, we must you must have a very close, very close uh, interaction with the yes, intervention yes, cardiologist over that, here, GL right. cardiologist over here, uh, yes. and try to uh, try to go for it because uh, until I you do this, this, your horizon of act uh, of work will be will not be widened enough. So thank you very thank much. You, for you're this absolutely comment. right, sir. We are uh, we are trying to initiate programs with heart failure. And we uh, actually, sir, I am very blessed uh, to be with you at this session. And I have also uh, uh, previous lectures. I have also gone through your previous lectures and previous uh, uh, sessions of this uh, IPDI. And thank you, Mohsin, sir, uh, for giving me opportunity to be here. Thank you, sir. <laughs> sir, Asalaamu Alaikum. It was an excellent presentation, as always. And it was so powerful, so energetic and stimulating lecture. I'm really proud of you, sir. So my, I have two uh, quick questions. Uh, markers, BNP or pro-BNP, which one is more sensitive? Another quick question is, sir, during COVID era, there is a challenges man during management of the heart failure. Uh, sir, say a few words about this, sir, please. Uh, the first one is uh, the uh, natriuretic peptides. Basically, uh, both uh, both the, uh, are are equally important in case of heart failure only. But when if we use uh, ARN especially, then possibly the NT pro BNP is very important because there there will be increase of BNP in other way. You know it. So this is the only uh, aspect where uh, you do only uh, NT pro BNP. But you can you can do in other cases either NT pro BNP or pro, or BNP. What what is cheaper and what is available for you? And uh, regarding a heart failure, basically, uh, I think it has got a lot of discussion in different sectors around the management of heart failure in COVID uh, COVID era. Actually, in heart failure patients, there is no single protocol to be used for heart failure in uh, in in. 
COVID era. It depends on the stages of COVID infection and the myocardial status. And accordingly, the, the patient should be treated with, uh, uh, with the anti-heart failure therapies, which are standard we use. So, but important aspect is we have to uh, monitor the patient very closely, especially hemodynamic monitoring and for uh, other. Another important aspect is the, the patient who died uh, of uh, COVID, most of the patients, a significant of the number of patients are having high blood pressure. Sure. Even those patient heart failure who had uh, almost normal pressure or with lower heart pressure, they may develop uh, a higher blood pressure in COVID infection. Don't know what is the cause? So these are the aspects you are to follow and try to use medium or short-acting drugs this in this period because you are you need to you may need to uh, change the doses according to the clinical situation of the patient. And of course, we have to have a very keen uh, uh, part, uh, part for renal function because sometimes renal function will also deteriorate. So there is no different drugs which can be used for only COVID patients, but the same drugs as used. Uh, similarly, the AC inhibitors and ARB and RNA has been, uh, has been uh, given endorsed by the different uh, guidelines all over the world. Uh, that can be used. Well, uh, 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 so it's always a pleasure to uh, listen to you. And uh, when it started, when I started my journey in NICBD, until now, if I get an opportunity to hear you, I never miss it. Anyway, sir, uh, your <laughs> lecture you. is always offered something new, at least to me, that you have shown that the uh, beta blockers are uh, equal, uh, around 40% uh, preventive for heart failure death, as well as the addition of uh, uh, RNA in the uh, treatment regime also has these effects. So this is a new information to me. As I knew that the ARNI was compared with the uh, previous treatment with the uh, AC inhibitor or ERB, particularly Valsartan in a few studies. So it's a new information. And if we combine these two, what we usually do, the, uh, can the uh, uh, improvement uh, or uh, protection from uh, the mortality is increased? So I have another question just for you that it's the heart failure is always a challenging uh, aspect in our clinical practice. Whenever we give round in our words, we find many people with uh, heart failure. In fact, maximum uh, number of Uh, loop diuretics and if uh, more uh, uh, resistant you can add with the uh, uh, dyes. this is called sequential dyes. so this is number one and the dosing the, uh, the most of the drugs used are also used in hypertension like H inhibitor ARB RNA or are used in hyper so they have got an uh, uh, hypertensive hypotensive effect so those so these drug doses should be uh, should be targeted uh, to according to the blood pressure. Another important is the the presence of symptoms is important. For example, if you see somebody is very symptomatic, even in the blood pressure systolic 120, and there are certain patients who are not symptomatic, even the blood pressure is uh, is 90. So if the patient is not symptomatic, then you can continue with that blood pressure. But remember that whether there is adequate renal uh, renal perfusion is there or not. Uh, which can be given by, say, EGFR. You have to uh, calculate EGFR. EGFR calculation is better than single uh, creatinine or uh, burn uh, indication. So this is the aspect. And uh, usually uh, the symptom, the other findings, very important to manage your drug doses. Manage your drug doses. So this is number one. Our problem, another is problem is 
the we always try to see a heart failure patient by the cardiologist but 80% patients should be seen by the gps and the internist follow up actually and we are to, we are there for the complicated cases because heart failure patients continuous monitoring not but in case of beta blocker in weeks always weeks. It, this should be the rule of thumb. I think that is a better suggestion. That is a better suggestion, actually. Thank you. Dr. Chitturaj Sama, please put your question. I think many of the questions is answered last uh, 30 minutes discussion. Dr. Chitturaj Sharma? Yes, yeah. sir. Sir, I am here. Sir, yeah. thank you for wonderful presentation, sir. Uh, my question is that uh, most of the patients, they are presented with a uh, feature of acute decompensated heart failure. With the precipitating factor, uh, I mean the treatment of precipitating factor, they, what is the chance of development or increase in ejection fraction? And how could I follow up those present with acute decompensated heart failure? Uh, basically, uh, ADHF, acute decompensated heart failure patients, uh, they present with acute heart failure. So these patients, usually they are diagnosed from previous history that they are having heart failure. So either they, they suddenly they have got decompensation. So again, of course, we have to try to find what is the what is the worsening cause or precipitating cause. That but but that is very different. ADHF itself is a different phenotype of heart failure. So first thing is you ought to treat the patient, the acute heart failure patient, in the emergency room, in the ward, and then go for the follow up. Now they have got different stages of treatment. So that is a different issue. So I have not touched on this in here. So first thing, you have to uh, decompensate the patient. Decompensate patient has to be compensated first. And of course, at the same time, try to evaluate the different organs affected, renal and other organ. And of course, try to find out what may be the, uh, may be the uh, uh, precipitating factors. Precipitating factors, if it is infection, of course, you have to treat it. If the precipitating factors is sometimes habitual, say from smoking and other, you have to stop it later. So treatment in ADHF is the primary patient for stabilization. And after the stabilization, you must query why this had happened. And if you find some causes, you just address it. If you find a new disease is treatable by drugs, you will treat it. If you find some new condition where surgery may relieve, you could do it. If, the, if you find that patient has deteriorated from a previous stable stage to severe stage, where by different parameters, the CRT is indicated, or the CRT, uh, ask the patient to go to the CRTP. So one important aspect is heart failure is not a curable thing, but it presents in different ways. And ADHA, ADHA pre pre presentation is one of the medical emergency, and this should be first treated with uh, as an emergency, and then go for the subsequent visit. Thank you. Thank you, sir. sir can I put some uh, comment? Yes. Uh, yes, I had some observation in why the patients are getting readmitted for heart failure and found out some interesting things. Most of our patients who are getting readmitted in the hospital because uh, around six causes. One is they are not adhering to the important drugs. They are continuing some vitamin but not taking the heart failure drugs. Number two, they are not adhering to fluid restriction or salt restriction. Number three, they are anemia has not been controlled. Number four, their diabetes is not controlled. Number five, their renal function is compromised. And that's why the medicine that has been used is actually worsening the condition. And number six, very surprisingly, many of the patients have occult hypothyroidism. And after correction of that, these patients get improved. But very simple things actually cause, oh, I have forgotten one thing, NSAID use. He has some orthopedic problem or physical medicine. He has gone there. They have given some NSIT. Patient has taken that. Come back to us with heart failure. Nobody has told them or asked them what medicine they are taking, what other condition they have. And we have given NSIT to worsen the heart failure. Six or seven things you take care. Most of the patients are well. Thank you, sir. Do you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mohsen. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, Nozul sir covered everything. Uh, I, I must thank sir. Sir was my examiner in uh, my MD, MD final part. Uh, and uh, sir, uh, sir, uh, I, I am a sir, uh, 
slide, showing the slide, how articulated it was. Very nice slide, and slide transition was so nice that I was amazing. Still, we are, uh, we present sometimes, but we are trying to make slides like this. But but uh, we are not happy. But I see the slides, sir, sir slide. It was very nice. I just want to uh, add on comment. Just uh, SGL2 inhibitors, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, as it is indicated in uh, ESC guideline uh, 2009 in diabetes with uh, cardiovascular disease, class on indication to reduce uh, as it is used the death rate and also the cardiovascular morbidity. And these effects are uh, not related to the uh, glucose lowering effect. These effects exactly. are due to the direct effect on heart, like the reduced uh, preload, as if this is a diabetic effect. Reduce some hypothetical, load, some hypothetical uh, uh, after load and also uh, endothelial reduced endothelial dysfunction and also they uh, produce some um, some sorts of um, nutrients like uh, other than glucose uh, that, that uh, ketone beta hydroxybutyrate to alternative source of uh, nutrition for the heart. These like these are unrelated to the diabetic effect but have beneficial effect. But still uh, these are indicated in diabetes with heart failure and hope for the next. Sir, I have a question to you actually uh, regarding the um, BNP level, sir. Uh, as uh, it is the demarcated, which sometimes demarcated acute heart failure or chronic heart failure with uh, bronchial asthma, acute. Uh, the uh, the uh, level, if it, it is an intermediate level, let's like, uh, say level come 400 or 500, uh, or we thought that this is not significant, but it uh, if it come uh, uh, 2,000 or 3,000, it is significant. So, sir, but 400, 500 is uh, more than the uh, normal level. But we are not uh, convinced that it is a heart failure, sir. Please, would you please comment on this, sir? Uh, uh, actually, for this uh, entry BNP level, actually, the very recently, uh, you see that uh, there is uh, some uh, guidelines, and they have divided these levels into three categories. One from this level to that level it is normal and from this level to this level is gray zone they call it gray zone and from above that that they call it, uh, call it a diagnostic level so uh, actually uh, uh, number one number two is then ntbnp again has been divided for the age of the age vision the higher the age the higher the level so this is a long term so i cannot give you the exact number but i can uh, share the slides sometimes later so those patients who are in the gray zone, you must try to diagnose by other means, adding it. If you have got certain other factors, say, for example, uh, uh, say symptom signs, echocardiography, in favor of heart failure, then take this gray zone as a positive one. And if you do not find that one, then you re remain it within the gray zone. But try to keep an eye on this particular patient. There may be something happen why this NTPNP is increasing. So this is, uh, this is important. In fact, when uh, this was uh, taken as a, as, as, a guide for, uh, as a guide for heart failure patient uh, in shape division emergency patient, there was a long debate around this point. So typically they come to this point that you see some normal level, some gray zone level, and then And for uh, uh, general guideline, for general guideline, for general physician, for other guidelines are always uh, produced for the general physician. They have given that guideline, the ESC guideline and the American guideline, almost the same. So that is Thank Islam. I think, uh, uh, yeah, I think. It's Dr. John joins here. Dr. joins here. Dr. joins here. This, uh, yeah, this chart sir? actually, as far as I know, this chart of gray zone has been. I think is it available in Brown notes book? If you try and get, can go and see. Thank you, Nuzul Islam, sir, for yes. your extraordinary presentation, sir. I have a question. Uh, I think that RNA is a very magical drug in heart failure and uh, our observation that few patients have uh, become near normal or normal ejection fraction after using this drug a few months later. So should we continue? <coughs> okay. So that's it. line get again. Okay, so I already discussed. Already discussed, Arni. Already discussed. No, no. The point was he was asking when the patient's ejection fraction gets normal, should he stop using this because this is a very expensive drug? Oh, okay, okay. 
they made some message from the uh, audience participants. Should we continue the learning? Basically, uh, uh, basically uh, if possible, if, if his economic is, uh, is uh, all right, he can take it. So this is better better idea to continue with this drop. But if they do not uh, have the idea, if able to continue the drug, they can even go revive back to the next standard drug, Cyrus inhibitor. Uh, that is the whole idea. Actually, uh, the treatment in our country or our society or in the low and mid income countries is very different. We always have to think the uh, drug, drug treatment availability of the service monitoring system in our prescription of the drug. Uh, when I, I used to prescribe uh, army to any patients, I always ask that this is the drug. This drug you have to take lifelong if it works, if there are no side effects. But this drug is very costly. Can you continue the drug uh, for a long time? If they do not, I usually uh, don't have. Somebody always ask that they, if I continue for some time and come back or if I'm go, uh, up uh, somebody told me that uh, I can take in a lower doses. So this is not that thing. But when you prescribe a drug, try to go for the highest dose tolerable and which has been used in the guideline, uh, which in the trials as it is. That is important. So, sir, sir the, can you can you break the, the tablet break the by half half piece? Can you take the uh, tablet in the breaking the tablet in half piece and half dose in the morning in the half is possible this drug? Uh, uh, this this thing I asked them. Sometimes uh, uh, is half dose. Uh, the they, they can half dose, so that that is maybe maybe uh, cheaper, maybe cheaper. Uh, but my my basic idea is, I always tell my patient that uh, have you seen the tablet? See. Well, if I the tablet, yes. Had, is the tablet is scored? Means there is a if there is a score in the bundle. Yeah. Then you can half it. If it doesn't, so I cannot be half. Yes, sir. But actually, uh, but actually very difficult. Can, yes, sir. Can I put in something, sir? Yeah. Uh, I had some experience because uh, in this country, the first uh, army use has been started by myself. Uh, I, my patient is to, uh, the company has to arranged a special uh, arrangement before it was registered in here. My patient was getting that. In postpartum cardiomyopathy, many of my patients from 30% or 25% have gone back to additional fraction as high as 55% to 65%. And in some of these patients, when they are stabilized over at least six months, I have stopped the drug and monitored. Some of my patients, after monitored back after three months, when the stop is, drug is stopped and have been substituted by only Vasart, and the patient is maintaining well. Maybe in selective cases, we can do that. But in most cases, no. It should have been uh, continued lifelong. And other thing is that when you start the earning, you have to start a, as per his blood pressure. And very surprising, you start at a lower dose. Even they suggested that dose, you start at lower dose and start gradually increasing. You will find out surprising that the patient is tolerating. And then gradually you can go back to the desired level. So as Sarva was saying, guideline or directions should be changed, modified according to case by case basis, individually. Personalized medicine is the way to go forward. Thank you. Professor Jalal, uh, please, regarding, uh, uh, regarding the postpartum or peripartum cardiomyopathy, there are a lot of patients uh, uh, develop heart failure, but with simple diuretics, uh, they, they can be improved. And many, at least 20% I have seen, they improved without any drugs except diuretics. But uh, of course, there are about 50% patients. If you uh, tie up the patient with AC inhibitor or anything, you can stop it after three, four months, uh, it will improve. In those cases, uh, uh, those cases, uh, uh, you, you can stop the uh, or other drugs. But uh, remember that many, many times this patient may develop other uh, other disease, whether the patient was simply peri uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy or he has got a lot of other uh, pathophysiology behind it. You have to check it up. So as Odud was uh, saying, that, that is an important uh, observation uh, that you can stop uh, after, uh, after five days. But again, you have to follow the patient up. Yeah. Because uh, in very pertinent cardiomyopathy, you do not know the exact cause why this patient went to heart failure. I have seen one patient, I have labeled him as a pericardiac cardiomyopathy and DCM. And after three months, I found the patient with a hyper hypertensive heart. And he was, she was pregnant. So basically, the patient was having hypertension and that was not well treated, became pregnant. 
and even heart failure presented as in peripheral cardiomyopathy treated and uh, any hypertension again revert back so you must uh, consider everything uh, on the basis of uh, patient to patient and actually sir one of my uh, uh, indication of using i in this case the patient should have at least more than 3 months of diagnosis yes. peripheral cardiomyopathy of, because of it's course. a very expensive drug of course yes. then only i started and then followed up uh, i have followed up this patient up to more than 2 years 3 two, uh, yes. two and a half years and the result is sometimes very gratuitous thank you professor jawabuddin sir do you hear me sir assalam alaikum sir sir uh professor dozer so i thank professor nozer sir for uh assalam alaikum sir presenting the uh, presenting the very elaborate subject both before and in the previous lecture and the present lecture also yes uh, mention all the aspects of heart failure causes uh, presentations and treatment in our country the difficulty is that to treat the heart failure যখন দেখি پیشنট খুব সিভিয়ার সিম্পটম নে আসে আমাদের কাছে হাসপাতালে ভর্তি হয় তখন তার সে যখন ডায়াবেটিক এবং আদার ড্রাগস পেয়ে সিম্পটমলেস হয়ে যায় তখন সে پیشنট আর হাসপাতালে থাকতে চায় না এটা একটা ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট সাই যে তাকে আমরা ফুল ট্রিটমেন্ট দিয়ে সারতে পারি না সেই پیشنট গুলোকে আমার মনে হয় কাউন্সেলিং ইজ ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট যে কাউন্সেলিং টু দা پیشنট অ্যাজ ওয়েল অ্যাজ টু দি রিলেটিভ অফ দি پیشنট Uh, near relative of the person how to continue the treatment and what happens if any new problems occurs they should come to the hospital once again and uh, uh, consult the doctor nearest uh, dr uh, khalid mohsin mentioned my uh, uh, target to have one rehabilitation center i started but <laughs> professor nozrul has also tried to continue it but it could not be done it is very very important because when the patient comes with heart failure and gets treatment and reduces the uh, symptoms and signs of heart failure but the causes of heart failure and the heart failure itself continues but how to what happens uh, afterwards uh, if the patient is put in cardiac rehabilitation then uh, they are frequently they go for echocardiography extracts and other investigations of the comorbidities and professor atahar described this sudden cardiac death up in heart failure how to diagnose that one if the patient is put in cardiac rehabilitation program then the things comes in that the echocardiography and also the stress test professor nadir sam have already mentioned everything but it is not done practically but i think now we should uh, uh, continue and we should, we should start these things if most of the patients in heart failure if not most many of the patients in heart failure dies at home suddenly even is getting the proper treatment So in that case, if the patient is put on cardiac rehabilitation by the echocardiography, you can uh, 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 follow up in echocardiography, then uh, halter monitoring. Then we can diagnose whether the patient has uh, signs of uh, arrhythmia, which may cause heart attack. So uh, if it is not possible also for the uh, uh, for cardiac rehabilitation program. then still the after uh, at the time of research the patients patient as well as the patients at the should be properly uh, counseled to continue this treatment and to, uh, what happens if he gets new symptoms thank you very much prof professor nazrul islam for uh, giving two lectures uh, of heart failure and maintain managing the everything what the patient needs thank you very much Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, for yeah. the others, for the juniors, I like to say that uh, Professor Jalal sir is my teacher in first year MBBS class in Dalhousie Medical College in Fijalos. So starting from the prime, uh, from my uh, graduation level, later I got as a trainee in ICBD, 
and still now we are a very good colleague according to this. And SAR actually started uh, with this rehabilitation program and we have created a post in NICBD as a physical medicine uh, professor, professor and associate professor of physical medicine of cardiac rehabilitation. But somewhere or other, nobody of us could, uh, could uh, break through the barriers uh, which we cannot uh, develop uh, rehabilitation. So thank you, sir. It's now thank you, sir. We are already, already uh, two hours, two and half hours left. Uh, Nudul, sir, thank you, few comments uh -huh. before conclusion. Nudul, sir, please, uh, few comments. Uh, your conclusion uh, is uh, uh, again, uh, again, uh, one thing is important that uh, I, I very sincerely from my mind thank you, Professor Wadud and uh, Mohsin for uh, arranging such things. And uh, we can develop this is how we can continue our medical education and interact with each other. Uh, today, I have learned a lot of things from here, from uh, for my country, and from uh, participants from Nepal. A lot of uh, things I have already learned from here. And uh, I like to participate in this type of programs for as long as I live. And uh, Allah Ta'ala, if permits, permits, I remain healthy. So uh, thank you, everybody, especially uh, my teacher, Professor Jalal, uh, who uh, actually got in there and gave some important points uh, for our, our, our student and, and myself. Thank you, sir. And thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wadu Abdul Wadu, sir. Uh, it, is, it is really, again, I'm saying, it's a privilege uh, to listen to Professor Nodusar's lecture. As always, it has been comprehensive, all-encompassing, beautifully presented, and updated. And the art of presentation of a complex subject in a nutshell. We can learn from him, as Dr. Noor Alam was pointing out. This is something very important because as doctors, we have to be good communicators. As teachers, we, we should not be in the, have the, only the title of professor. We should be the professor. Professor Nodusar is encompassing all that. And clearly, Clearly, it's something that has to be aspired by everyone, our juniors, when we have to be put in their charge. I do hope the listeners in here, one day they will take care of of me, of endeavor, the dedication. that will bring the real fruit for all of us. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Insepta, for helping us, for un uh, taking, undertaking this great adventure of online knowledge. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir. Now, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Professor Radhul, sir. I, 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 NB, sir, is smart, sir. So smart, Karim, sir. I always follow you, sir. I would prepare the slide most nicely, sir. I would deliver. Always I amazed you, sir, uh, presentation different from the previous presentation. So, uh, so, so laborious presentation, sir. I always envy your smartness, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, it is doing, sir, it is doing for a long years, uh, many years together. About 10 or 15 years back, he used to make his slide himself. So nice. Yeah, I know, I know. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the participants. Um, we are we are running in a very very uh, shocking times. Lots of our colleagues at night due to COVID era. But more than 200 participants participated in this today's class. Thank you everybody. Thank you dear panelist. Also Professor Jalal sir and all the renowned participants in Bangladesh and community abroad. Thank you everybody. Thanks Inspector Pharmaceuticals for doing a tremendous job for last last two months. Also Dr. Parif and as well as Professor Abdul Wadi Choudhury. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.